You are listening to TBR Radio Presents, The Dixie Heritage Show, with your host, the director of Dixie Heritage, Dr. Ed DeVries. On last week's TBR Radio Presents, The Dixie Heritage Show, we were talking about secession. Unfortunately, we ran out of time just as I was about to read from a book called The History of Texas, which is a multi-volume, pretty much encyclopedia. And I was going to explain exactly how does a state go about seceding from the Union. But unfortunately, we ran out of time. And so we're going to pick up this week right where we left off. The January 28th, 1861 listing in the History Book of Texas. It's referring to Sam Houston, and it says this, quote, Houston's views, however, carried little weight among the secessionists in the state who were clearly in the majority. But by refusing to call the legislature into session, the increasingly unpopular Houston temporarily blocked his opponents from any official action. The secessionists countered Houston's maneuver by calling on the people of Texas to elect delegates to the secession convention to meet in Austin. Their purpose was to consider what action Texas should take on the secession issue in light of the recent sequence of events and the result of a total of 177 delegates being elected. This was two delegates for each county in Texas. The convention met on January 28, 1861. Four days later, on February 1st, its members voted by a margin of 166 to 8 to secede from the Union. They drafted and signed an ordinance of secession, which repealed and annulled the Texas Annexation Law of 1845, which was the means by which Texas had joined the Union to begin with. The Ordinance of Secession was subsequently approved by a popular vote in a statewide election. So how did Texas secede? Basically, the people of each county held an election. They elected two representatives to go to a convention. Once the convention was convened, the delegates who were elected by the people to go to the convention debated the issue back and forth, and then they finally drafted a document of secession, or as it was called, an Ordinance of Secession. And that ordinance was put up for a statewide voter referendum, And every qualified voter in Texas went to a ballot box somewhere and either voted yes or no. So the decision of secession was literally made by the people of Texas. It wasn't made by politicians in smoke-filled rooms. It wasn't made in the governor's office. Nor was it made in the back room of a meeting of some unknown power elite. Literally, the people of Texas held a statewide election and voted yes or no for secession. And each of the other southern states seceded in exactly the same way. So secession was not made suddenly, and it was not done in secret. It didn't sneak up on anybody. In fact, the whole world saw it coming, long before it happened. And during the whole time they were talking about it, no one was ever rising up and saying, Hey man, you can't do that. In fact, I'll tell you the only mistake that I believe the southern states made in their secession, and that was when they were talking about secession, They weren't listening to the Republicans because before the first southern state ever seceded, before the first southern state even had a convention, in 1860, the Republican Party held their convention in Boston, Massachusetts. They adopted this platform for Abraham Lincoln to run on. It said this, We seek a dissolution of the Union and resolve that we do hereby declare ourselves the enemies of the Constitution of the Union and of the government of the United States and resolve that we proclaim it as our unalterable purpose the determination to live and linger for the dissolution of the present union, unquote. In other words, the radicals in the Republican Party adopted a campaign platform under which Abraham Lincoln both wrote and campaigned. And they said, we're going to dissolve the American Union. We're going to kick the cotton states out of the country. We don't want to be in the same country with Southerners anymore. And if we can win this presidential election and get enough of our own people in Congress, we're going to do this and we're going to kick them out. Well, guess what, folks? The Republicans won that election. They got Mr. Lincoln in the White House, and they got all their people in Congress. So what was the mistake of the Southern leaders in their secession? Well, simply, it was this. They just got out too soon. They should have just waited and let the Yankees kick them out. I honestly believe that if the Southern states had waited, they would not have had to secede. Historians as early as 1867 were writing, quote, I will stress that this war was not waged by the North to preserve the Union nor to maintain Republican institutions, but to destroy both. 
it will be seen that the war waged the entire character and system of our government, the overthrow of the states and the rights of the government against the wishes of the people. And that really is what happened. The whole fate and character of the United States was changed forever because the truth of the matter is, as I said last week, secession was biblical, secession was given of God, secession was the means by which the United States of America was formed. And secession was the right to preserve the particular or sovereignty of individual states of that union. So when the right of secession was denied the states and the states basically allowed the federal government to forbid their exercise of the right of secession, and giving up that right by default, they gave up all their other rights and their sovereignty as well. So in essence, the result of the war and the failed effort of the last Southern secession was the fact that states' rights perhaps forever died in this country. But however many years later in 1928, even the United States Congress came around and said, you know what, those Southerners were right. They did have the right to secede. Hey guys, we're sorry. Yeah, that finally happened by resolution of the United States Congress, but not until 1928. Anyways, back to the secession of uh, Judah from Israel that we talked about last week, that uh, dividing of God's chosen nation into northern and southern kingdoms. Uh, people cannot truly be free without the means of withdrawing themselves from the illicit and deep and tyrannical regime. The Israelites of old understood this, as did our forebears in 1787 and 1788. They knew that at some time their descendants would find it necessary and profitable to dissolve the political bonds they were forming. And that time came in 1860 and 1861. Indeed, it's come again in the 21st century, if we are to be a free people. So what are you telling us, preacher? Well, you all know the age-old saying, if at first you don't secede, try and try again. Open your web browser and type in www.barnesreview.org and discover the Barnes Review magazine. In the Barnes Review, you will read vignettes of man, from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There is no more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review magazine in its print form, or in convenient electronic delivery. Our host has been a subscriber to both formats for years. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. My good friend Keith Alexander over at the political cesspool sent me a copy of this new bill that, this, that they passed down there in Florida. And a lot of uh, my patriot friends, a lot of uh, people who are pro-secession are praising this law in Florida. I asked the question on last week's TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Show if maybe, just maybe, in passing this law and promoting it, if Governor DeSantis isn't actually going the path of King George III. I said we'd talk about it let's, this week, so let's do that. As uh, one of my uh, patriot friends uh, told me the other day, Governor DeSantis just dropped a tactical nuke on Antifa and BLM, announcing the terms of Florida's new Law Enforcement Protection Act. And you notice that the media has billed this as a law that's against rioting. But look at what it's called, the Law Enforcement Protection Act. This isn't a law that's designed to benefit the people. It's designed to benefit law enforcement. Who's that? Why, the police. The jackbooted thugs who the government uses to, to go around and rough up the people who don't do what it says. So just who does this Law Enforcement Protection Act protects law enforcement from? We the people! In other words, this law declares us the people, the citizens, to be the enemy. I've said this a lot of times, and I'll say it again. Every three-year-old in Cuba knows that that cop walking the street carrying a gun does not exist to protect them. Every three-year-old in Cuba knows that that cop walking the street carrying a gun exists to keep the government in power over them. Why should we believe that it's any different here in the United States or any other country in the world for that matter? Bottom line, the police are the thug squad for the government. Bottom line, if the police need to be protected from the people, 
I thought the police were supposed to protect the people, but anyways. Let's move along with this. Before I do, let me say this. Any bill that gives government more power is bad. It is always bad to give power to the government. Always. No exception. And so, I'm going to have to oppose this one if for no other reason because it gives more power to the government. Let's break this down. First of all, if you're arrested during a riot, you stay in jail until you stand before a judge. But who gets to determine whether your assembly, and by the way, the right of assembly is protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. But who gets to determine if your assembly is a peaceful assembly or a riot? Yeah, the jackbooted thugs. Yeah, that's right. Another point, if you participate in a riot, you forfeit your state benefits and the ability to work for the government. I guess it's a good thing that this law wasn't in place uh, back during the Boston Tea Party or a lot of patriots would have lost their government jobs. I love this one. Strike a cop. Mandatory. Six months minimum. What makes cops so special that they can't get hit like anybody else? I'm, I'm being serious now. Okay, these guys show up. They're dressed in bulletproof Kevlar armor. They're carrying heavy weapons and they're pointing it at you. But apparently you do not have the right to defend yourself. I'm sorry, but if I'm being assaulted by somebody, I don't care if he's a cop. I don't care if he wears a badge. I don't care if he works for the government. If I'm being assaulted by somebody, I have the right to defend myself. Let's go back to colonial America. They didn't have police as we know them today. They had soldiers. I bet King George would have loved to have passed a law mandatory six months minimum in prison for striking one of his officers. It's the same thing. Folks, if we're going to secede in the modern day, who do you think is going to be at the front line of the government effort to stop us? It's going to be the cops. They're going to be the ones breaking up our meetings. They're going to be the ones breaking up our parades. They're going to be the ones breaking up our protests. They're going to be the ones breaking up our debates and our attempts to form secession conventions. People have the right to defend themselves against the cops. Mandatory six-month minimum for striking a cop. If that's not tyranny, I don't know what is. Under this new Florida law, a violent assembly, and again, who gets to determine what assemblies are violent? The, oh, the government does? Wow, isn't that a convenient thing? Anyways, violent assembly is a felony. Was the Boston Tea Party a violent assembly? They did a lot of property damage. In other words, it goes both ways. You can't have it one way and not the other. Do I like Antifa? Absolutely not. But if I have rights, they have rights. You can't have it both ways. This is my favorite one. Any local government that refuses to provide adequate protection for its citizens will forfeit sovereign immunity protection, allowing citizens to sue that local government for compensation. First of all, what local government actually does protect its citizens? Has my local government protected me from excessive property taxes? No. Does my local government protect me from the possibility of having a police officer force me off the road and assaulting me in my vehicle? No, they do not. So when the local government refuses to provide protection for people exercising their First Amendment rights, and again, who gets to determine what adequate protection is? Oh, the, the government does. Again, how convenient. And any municipality that defunds the police will not be able to receive any other uh, form of uh, government funding. I'm sorry, Governor DeSantis, but the state of Florida has an obligation to maintain the roads and to do other things for those municipalities whose politics disagree from yours. What is my point? My point is, is that just like the removal of Confederate statues, there are more than adequate laws already on the books that could prevent that from happening and that could punish people from who do it. So why are all the Confederate monuments coming down? It's called selective application of the law. There's already law in place that would allow for people, patriots, God-fearing, peaceful Americans, uh, to protest, to, to uh, seek redress of grievance against their government. The law is already there to protect them and enable them to do that. The law is also there that when uh, a group like Antifa decides to burn down a city or Black Lives Matter decides to burn down Minneapolis, the laws are in place to prevent that and to punish them. 
But again, it's selective application. I used to like Governor DeSantis. Now I'm not so sure. Maybe he's just another wannabe tyrant. Obviously, the fact that he would sign a law, a bill, it's not a law, because there's but one lawgiver and that is God. And Governor DeSantis isn't God, neither is the Florida legislature. But the fact that Governor DeSantis would sign such a tyrannical bill as this, Florida doesn't need a law like this. And the fact that the governor and the state legislature would even propose such a thing, let alone enact it. They've essentially declared the people of their state their enemy. Plain and simple. Again, anything that gives government more power is bad. All this does is establish that the government of Florida is headed to tyranny. And other states of this union that are equally, if not more, bent towards tyranny than Florida will probably soon enough enact a similar legislation. And it's just going to make it that much harder for those of us who do love liberty and freedom to secede and to affect the change that needs to be made to approach our government and affect a redress of grievance. So for all of my patriot friends out there who are saying this is a good thing, rethink this thing, get your head screwed on straight. This is just one more act of tyranny that our future demands we oppose. Let's break for a quick commercial. Extra, extra, we all about it. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door, packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. And find out about the American Free Press. Do it today. Extra, extra, we all about it. I mentioned in the last segment selective application of the law. We don't need a new law. We just need to uh, properly and equitably execute the ones that we have. But it goes beyond even selective application. There's direct and blatant misapplication. And the danger of a law such as this one is that it's just waiting to be misapplied. And do you want an illustration of this? Go back to 2017. Go back to Charlottesville. There were two groups there. There was a peaceful group. And they were rallying and we'll even say protesting in defense of Confederate monuments. Then there was a violent group, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, wanting to tear those monuments down. Which group did the government declare to be violent? The truly violent group, the Antifas, the Black Lives Matters? No, they declared the peaceful patriots to be the violent protesters. And they declared the violent protesters who were burning and looting and truly assaulting and beating people up. They declared them to be the peaceful ones. There was a man who just wanted to get away from it all. And he tried to get in his car and drive away. The police chased him down. They arrested him. They tried him for murder. He's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. He did nothing wrong. He was trying to get away from the violence. And when the truly violent ones started smashing at his car while he was just trying to drive it away and get out of there, again, misapplication. And this is something that is going to be misapplied. Maybe Governor DeSantis would never misapply it. But Governor DeSantis is not going to be the last governor of Florida unless Jesus comes back. What about the next governor of Florida or the governor after that or the governor after that? Or what about the liberals that run South Florida or even the middle of the Florida uh, up around Gainesville in the middle of the peninsula there? Is Sheriff Sadie Darnell, that liberal Marxist in Alachua County there where Gainesville is, is she going to apply this law the same way that perhaps Governor DeSantis intended it? Who knows? Again, this is just a bad law. It's tyranny, folks. It's tyranny. Even if it's not tyrannically applied now, we've given our enemies 
a weapon to use against us somewhere down the road. Because ultimately, whenever you give power to the government, they will use it to keep themselves in power or give themselves more power. So when we must rightfully oppose their power, they will use the power that they are being given now. They will use it against us. Let's break for another commercial. Phone with our good friend, Clint Lacey. So your newest project is you've started a publishing company, Foothills Media, and uh, you'll be publishing uh, three tremendous books. Uh, the first of those is your book, The Beginner's Guide to False Flags. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about that book? If you were wondering how we ended up at this point in our history and everything's going on, Beginner's Guide to False Flag takes you from the beginning of the country until uh, the election of Donald Trump, Charlottesville, the rise of the communists, and the Russian collusion hoax, the rape of Delaware County, the story in which a United States veteran uh, defended himself against a known uh, drug felon only to find out that the local police were in on it. Crooked prosecutors, and one of those prosecutors was actually arrested coming back from uh, an island in the Caribbean uh, in a murder-for-hire plot. And it just details uh, just how corrupt one small county can be. And in the book, I said that Delaware County, Oklahoma, in the past was a safe haven for uh, outlaws from Missouri and Arkansas. And what the reader will find out, it still is. Blood in the Ozarks, expanded second edition, 156-year-old government cover-up cover in which out-of-control uh, union officer led his men to uh, murder men, women, and children at a Christmas gathering in the Missouri Ozarks. I found it Foothills Media in uh, 2019 because... I'm dedicated to bringing you the truth. Thank you, Clint. I know that our listeners are going to want to check out Foothills Media, so tell them how they can do so. Well, you can visit us at foothillsmedia.net, and that will take you to our website where you can uh, browse the books, read our blog posts, and uh, uh, catch up on news that you won't find anywhere else in the mainstream media. Foothillsmedia.net. you want another possible illustration of how this legislation in Florida could be misapplied, misused, abused, look back to January 6th when patriotic Americans, peaceful people for the most part, entered the United States Capitol building. Some of them even went into the House chamber. By the way, it's the people's house. The Constitution of the United States says that they have every right to be in that chamber, even when the House of Representatives is conducting its business. The Senate can close its sessions. The House, constitutionally, cannot. It must conduct its business in front of the people at all times. It's the people's house. And yet these people were declared violent protesters by our government. There's a man who was walking through the hallway of the Capitol building, carrying a Confederate flag. He's now going to prison, as is his son, because the government of the United States declared them to be violent protesters when all they were doing was peaceably walking through a hallway carrying a flag. And there were at least two undersecretaries, cabinet-level people in the Trump administration who just happened to be in the Capitol at that time. They were arrested. They lost their positions in the Trump administration. At least one of them is probably going to prison. They just happened to be in the building conducting business. But because there were certain swamp creatures that wanted to see these Trump loyalists driven out of the government and couldn't just wait a few more days for Trump to move out and Biden to move in, they decided that they were going to go after these people. If there was a law in place such as the one in Florida, no doubt they would have gone after them even more easily and more severely. Again, this is a bad, bad idea. If for no other reason, because it's the government that gets to decide who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. 
And as we've seen over and over again, they almost always get that decision wrong. Anyways, we have one more break, and then we'll be back with the final word. All right, I'm on the phone again with Dr. William Von Peters, who has been my uh, personal doctor for the last 10 years. We have a dear lady in our church, Dr. Von, who suffers from Lyme's disease. Is there anything that you could do to help her? Lyme quest, and I've had people tell me that uh, the Lyme quest is the only uh, formula that they've ever found that actually seemed to help them. What is the secret of Lyme quest that makes it effective when other treatments people are saying aren't working so well for them? Basically... What it does, it will cross the blood-brain barrier to be able to uh, get the body so that it can recognize uh, Lyme. So that Lyme uh, is a spirochete that will basically go into kind of a uh, dormant stage as a cocoon and then come out periodically to uh, replicate and then go back dormant again. And so as it's doing this, it gradually uh, destroys the immune system. So what we've done is basically used the homeopathics uh, that deal with the spirochete so that the body will recognize it and then get past its camouflage so that it can act against it. And so that the, the, most people will notice the, you know, an improvement in their symptomology and everything as their immune system uh, becomes stronger and not depleted by the uh, Lyme spirochete. Because homeopath- homeopathy, you know, the the philosophy is like cures like, and whereas allopathy, which is what the MDs use, is opposite cures. <laughs> so, you know, if you have something that, for example, if something's too hot, you give something that would cause a heat in the body, and it will it will tend to dissipate the heat. Then, uh, you know, such as coffee on a hot day, is uh, is an example of that in real life. So we don't make, and none of our products do we make medical claims for. And, you know, it's just to assist the body in, in healing and being able to heal itself. But we make no medical claims for it. And so if somebody wants to get Lyme Quest, try it for themselves, what do they need to do? Basically, just go to the website uh, for, the, for a company, Life Quest Formulas. And so that would be www.lifequest, Q-U-E-S-T, formulas, that's plural, lifequestformulas.com. All right, lifequestformulas.com. And for our radio listeners who happen to be watching on YouTube, that'll be on the screen as well. You'll want to go to LifeQuest Formulas, and you'll want to check this out, and you'll want to check out some of the other homeopathic products that Dr. Von Peters is offering there as well. <music> Were there bad guys at the Capitol on January 6th? Yeah, there were a few bad actors that day who really were violent and really did break things. And I'm not just talking about the Capitol Police, although they uh, probably did the lion's share of the damage themselves. But what about those bad actors? They walked away scot-free. Again, selective application of the law. Anyways, I was uh, having to take a break from our recording today, and I had to go run an errand. And I was driving down the road, and a little family of geese were crossing the road, and so I stopped, let the geese along their way, and then I was driving on and looking at the geese in my rearview mirror, the mama goose, the daddy goose, the little baby geese. I realized that if I were a liberal, I would just be appalled at the idea of running over whatsoever. And I would probably pass laws to stop people from harming these geese for the same reason that the liberals pass laws that say you can't hurt your dog. And I'm not advocating hurting dogs, by the way. But it's funny, these same liberals who would send you to prison for hurting your dog think it's okay for you to murder your child, which is why they advocate for totally and completely unrestricted abortion in this country. And again, these are the people who would be deciding who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. The people that laws such as this Law Enforcement Protection Act of Florida empower. But I gotta go. We're out of time for this week's TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Show. Go to our website, www.dixieheritage.net. 
Then tune in again next week, same time, same place. We'll have another great show for you.